Hey, it's CityCast Portland executive producer John Natariani here. You're probably wondering why we're in your feed for a second time today. Well, that's because we have a great conversation for you sponsored by OMSI with Christopher Marley. He's an Oregon-raised artist and naturalist who creates this really extraordinary art with rare organisms that he collects from across the world. I sat down with him to talk about his new exhibition, Exquisite Creatures Revealed, which opens this weekend at OMSI, and about the conservation message behind his work. I hope you enjoy the conversation. I want to hear a little bit about how you grew up. I know that you grew up in Salem here in Oregon, and I'm wondering as a kid what you saw there that got you interested in both art and the natural world. I think that the art side of it was pretty innate. Uh, I don't remember a time when I wasn't trying to draw and paint and create, especially, you know, monsters was really kind of the thing that, that the, only, the only thing I ever really wanted to draw and, and create were kind of fantastical creatures. But we lived kind of outside of town, and um, and I've always been just horrifically ADHD, and still am. And so <laughs> my parents would, you know, I'd drive them crazy, and they'd they'd kick me outside. And for whatever reason, I was just I was enamored with reptiles. Oregon's not the greatest place in the world to live if you're a reptile nut. We don't have as large a variety as a lot of other places do. But um, but I was always out looking for snakes and lizards, and and that just kind of kept me outside. And and I'm imagining that you would grab them and take them home and yep. scare your parents and the whole... <laughs> yeah, my mom was a saint. She let me keep a lot of different things for a little while. And boy, they almost invariably escaped. And so there was really never a time there where there wasn't some giant snake, either a store-bought exotic or or something that was, you know, something that I'd caught loose in our house somewhere. And so they would they would always turn up. In the places you least expect them, yeah. That's right, yep. <laughs> did you ever go to OMSI as a kid? I did. I remember so well, put my hand on the on the little ball in your hair, the static electricity ball. and Classic. And the big yeah. pendulum with the, with the pen and making designs. And no, I thought it was awesome. How did this interest of a kid exploring the backyard in Oregon, how does that blossom out into this thing where you're traveling everywhere and collecting these specimens and then creating this beautiful work out of it? It's kind of a, as you can imagine, a convoluted story, but, but you know, the passion for uh, the natural world and just especially for creatures never really waned. My passion for art only grew and I uh, ended up studying graphic design because I couldn't figure out how on earth I was going to make a living just drawing monsters. Got some opportunities to start working in the fashion world. Actually, the fashion world was kind of what paid for for my life. And uh, I ended up serving as a missionary in, in, the, in the Atacama Desert, northern Chile for a couple of years, and I had to pay for that. And so... Uh, so my, my stint in the fashion world uh, paid for that. And so I ended up living and working about 40 countries all over the world. And, and, uh, and boy, it was just an opportunity to get knee deep into exotic biomes. Yeah. So, so okay, you have this childhood fascination with creatures that you've always had. You have this sort of fine art training and this probably like an eye that you got from doing your advertising work of looking at the natural world maybe a little bit differently than your normal biologist might. Exactly. Like, so when did these pieces, these these works come out of that collision? Because you're also doing missionary work. You've had like 17 jobs. How did all of that come together? The missionary work ended. Um, I was in uh, in 90. So I was 88 to 90. I was I came home and and uh, and got back into fashion just to pay for school. And really what happened was I kind of had opportunities to to just try new markets over and over again. And I've always been I'm a horrible student and I didn't finish my degree. So I would take a semester here and semester there. And then it was about all I could take. And I would get back out into the out into different countries and then just try to f see what kind of crazy reptiles I could find in those different countries. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I started collecting was insects because that was the one thing that I could find that were, you know, that were they were crawling around everywhere. And, and yeah. I would and I was just as a collector, I just wanted to have something as a representation of each country I'd visited. After about 10 years of, uh, of traveling around the world, I had a, you know, I had a decent little insect collection. And I was living in Los Angeles and uh, and still in the fashion world, knowing that this wasn't my career. I mean, it was it just paid the bills. I really I didn't have a passion for it. Mm -hmm. I had to keep on breaking open these trunks and showing everyone <laughs> that visited my apartment. And, and <laughs> You've got these Los bugs. Angeles. Hey, look at my bugs. They're kind of shiny. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> okay, so you you have these crates of bugs, these trunks, these boxes full of bugs, like when, when did they start becoming pieces as opposed to just a collection? What happened was I, I just kind of started 
breaking them open and, and positioning them and just try to make something for my apartment that, yeah. you know, where, where people could come over and I could say, hey, look, this is the kind of represents where I've been. And your friends are saying, Chris is getting even weirder. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I had a few friends. <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, eventually uh, I had enough people say, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. I, this could be a career. And uh, I had an opportunity to just rent on a month-to-month -month basis this little tiny, it must have been 200 square feet mm -hmm. on Pier Avenue in Hermosa Beach. And it was just this fabulous location, but it was too small for anyone to use for anything. And I knew the guy who owned it. And, uh, and so I, I put up some pieces thinking, oh, I wonder if anybody would ever want to buy my, <laughs> my bug art. And we opened that in 99 and ended up being there for two years. And it was just, it was, swamp. we were swamped. And so it funded me tr being, being able to kind of retrace my steps, go back to a bunch of different countries, find new countries and, and really start to study uh, entomology and just kind of educate myself in ways that I hadn't been able to before. Yeah. Well, I, I want to jump ahead to talking about some of these pieces. And, and I'm interested in talking about this new exhibit, Exquisite Creatures Revealed. It's opening at OMSI later this week. In the broadest sense, someone's walking into this gallery to this exhibition at the Science Museum. What are people going to see when they walk in? One thing I like to guarantee people, and I feel very confident in this exhibition in particular, is that you will see things you have never seen before. And you will see creatures and probably plants that you did not even know exist. I can guarantee it. The last uh, 25 years, I've gotten really serious about researching and about uh, finding, just finding crazy aspects of the natural world that are, um, you know, not widely known and sometimes are not known to science. I have a studio in, in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia as well, and we have, uh, we're affiliated with a camp in Truzmadi, which is a, which is a, a beautiful area in, uh, in Borneo. And I think in the last five or six years, we've discovered about 300 new species oh uh, in, in that one 10 acre camp. Yeah. So it's really incredible. There's, there's so much out there that people uh, have not been able to experience yet. And so that's one thing that I, I want to promise people. You will see things you've never seen before. Yeah. And you've graduated from bugs at this point, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Insects are <laughs> actually, I don't, I don't do as very much work with insects anymore. I feel like I really was deep in insects for 10 or 15 years. And, and, uh, and now there's just the whole rest of the, of the natural world has been wide open. Really anything but mammals. I don't work with mammals at all. And then anything that is not an invertebrate, like an insect, uh, is, is something that is reclaimed. So I work with, which means that it died of natural causes or incidental causes, usually in captivity, not always. Um, but it's something that wasn't killed for, for the art. That's something that's very important to me as well. Like walk us through a few more of like actual things that people are going to see when they're sitting in this space. One of the things I'm so excited about is um, there are two Rafflesia specimens in this exhibit. And Rafflesia is the genus of the largest flower in the world. It's called the, the corpse lily. Oh my gosh. And they are, they are impossible to find because it's a, they're a parasite. There's no stem or leaf or roots or anything. There's just a little thread, this parasitic thread that enters into a particular type of vine. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's a, there's a number of different species of vine in, in, in different parts of Southeast Asia. The problem is they're, you know, they're almost microscopic. You can't see them at all. There's no indication on the vine that they have this parasite in them. But once every four to 20 years they create a giant pod that becomes this huge flower. The flower can be up to four feet wide in certain species. Mm -hmm. And they smell like rotting flesh and they, they bloom, they last about five days and then they, they just rot away. Oh my the God. other thing yeah. is, is they're so deep in the jungle, people have been able to find them and pick them and, and they'll put them in alcohol or they'll you know sun dry them. Mm -hmm. But I actually shipped a 2000 pound freeze dryer to my studio in Kuala Lumpur on the off chance that we would ever be able to locate one and we got two specimens and actually freeze dried them and they're very well preserved. So that's one thing that's just really exciting. And there's, a, there's six, 650 pieces in the exhibit. So that's one of, you know, 650. <laughs> and, and, and I think it's worth mentioning, like, you know, it's not going to be like every single one of these is just like on a table to look at. You're actually sort of bringing some of your visual language into the way that it's all presented, right? Absolutely. For example, that corpse flower, it's got a really bizarre internal kind of a cone. I actually snuck some LEDs into the inside of the middle of it, and then it sits on a lit platform. And so, yeah, of course, it, it's an intersection of art, nature, and science. And one of the things that, that's really important to me is that people are able to look at aspects of the natural world, whether they're familiar with them or not, in a completely new light. 
Yeah. So when people are at the exhibit and they're seeing these creatures for the first time, what should they be thinking about? Like, what might they not expect? It's important for me that people understand that everything they're going to see is real. And we tend to think that that outrageous iridescence and out, and ridiculously vibrant colors in are kind of the denizen of of humanity and of technology, but they're not. And so you'll see colors that that are hard to believe are actually crawling or flying or swimming around in nature, but everything you see is real. All the colors are completely true to life. You preserve these specimens. We didn't put any of your advertising sheen on them. Just... <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> exactly there how are... they look in nature. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. exactly right. So I say I say true to life rather than completely unretouched because there is a small percentage of specimens that just will not retain their color with with uh, preservation techniques, mm-hmm. and so we have to restore color on a few things. And they're never as vibrant uh, when we restore the color as they would be in in nature. But everything you see is is completely authentic. I'm wondering, when you're designing these things, you're working in your studio in Salem, you have who knows how many bins and boxes (laughs) and trunks full of creatures at this point. Like, how are you balancing, like, what you know about the biology of these creatures with, like, the way that they look when you put them next to each other? To me, their aesthetics is paramount. That's really is the, 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 the point of what I'm doing is to get people to fall in love with the aesthetics of nature in general, but really particularly exotic, weird organisms that don't always get a lot of love. I think that when people find something beautiful, they care about it more, they connect with it, they they want to conserve it, uh, they just feel differently about it than than you know something that they don't that they don't find beautiful. So I really try to beautify everything I work with. And I try to keep myself out of the design process to some degree because these you know, these are once living things. And, and to me, they're, they're, they have a degree of sacredness to them. So I, I always want to work with them in a way that really honors their, their life and kind of their, their immaculate design and, and shows off their colors. And it's a different approach really with every different type of organism. And sometimes the, I feel like the organisms kind of dictate the design. Yeah. Does it ever feel like you're putting together a puzzle? Like, like what's a challenge that you have in creating this stuff that no one's going to appreciate because it's in the gallery and it looks gorgeous and it looks perfect? What's like a real head scratcher of a day for you when you're putting this sort of thing together? There's the science side of it. I mean, sometimes it's just preserving something that, that you know, to my knowledge has never been well preserved or, or, or I have no, no information whatsoever about how to preserve it. And so, you know, over 25 years, I and my studio staff have, have kind of come up with some tricks and some, some chemicals and some different ways of approaching things. And so we've, we've actually uncovered a few things that are new ways of preserving certain types of organisms that have never worked in the past. And because I was foolish enough to not know that they're not supposed to work, <laughs> we just kind of found workarounds. Yeah. I'm sure on one hand, it's finding this stuff out in the wild, but then there's a whole nother, before it even gets to your studio, just transporting it across the world is is not easy stuff either. No, that's exactly right. Yeah. And we've had some, you know, we've obviously had some losses and some really scary experiences. Actually, in Borneo, I went to a fish market at one point, and uh, and there was all this bycatch that was um, just beautiful reef sharks, all different colors, and I didn't know anything about them, but they were so gorgeous, and they were just in this broken old bucket. They were going to be used for, I don't know, chum, I guess, and it just broke my heart. So we, I bought them all <laughs> and then thought, well, how am I going to get all these sharks, you know, frozen to my studio in, in Salem? And we arranged the whole thing, got them on a pallet and, and to, to overnight them, you know, all the permits and everything else is just a nightmare. And uh, they missed their connecting flight in, in Taipei. Oh, so they no. sat out on the tarmac in Taipei oh, no. for a day out in the, in the blistering sun. And I thought there's no chance they're going to make it. But, but I got the, the notice that they arrived in the middle of the night in, in Seattle and I rushed up there as fast as I could and, and most of them were salvageable. So oh, it, it just depends. I mean, there's, there's stories like that behind most of the things in, in the exhibit. You don't make it easy for yourself, Chris. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you did not take the easy way out on this. Kind of our mantra in the, in the studio. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. So we say that a lot. I, I do want to hear a little bit more, though, just about like the deeper message that you think is in this work, right? I mean, like we've talked about aesthetics and about just how exciting it is to show this work to people. But I'm wondering what you hope visitors are going to take away from this exhibit. I've become really passionate about connection in general. Technology is fabulous. You know, there's there's a lot to be grateful for. It seems like everything is working against us being connected to one another and us being connected to the natural world. 
my chief objective anymore, almost universally, uh, in whatever I write, in the films we create, in the pieces, in the in the way that I that I choose to work with the specimens, is to hope for creating an atmosphere and an experience where people feel awe, where they feel wonder, where they feel gratitude. And those emotions open the door to connection, to connection to one another and connection to the natural world and connection to ourselves in these fleshy organisms. Yeah. Well, this exhibit opens this weekend and it's going to be up until next February at OMSI. You know, clearly you've traveled all over the world and you've also shown this work at museums all over the country. This is your second show at OMSI, though. Uh, What's it like having your work being celebrated at your hometown museum? To be honest with you, just working with OMSI in general is such a joy. When we worked with OMSI the first time five years ago, it was really a different kind of experience. And I've been fortunate to work with some of the premier museums in the country. But for some reason, OMSI's staff and OMSI's kind of, their, the spirit that with which they work is different. And it's really, it's really special. And to be honest with you, we had such a tremendous response last time, and I think that has that says a lot about the you know the people in Oregon as well. That, that we just have a particular love and a particular fondness and passion for the natural world, and and it's just a good fit here. Well, last question on your website, you had a quote that says, "Even the most fearsome organisms can be experienced with fresh eyes." So, Chris, I hope I said that. <laughs> <laughs> what is the most fearsome organism that people are going to encounter? Boy, it probably would have to be one of the snakes. Um, I've got a a 13-foot-long king cobra. You're probably not going to survive that bite. There's about a six-foot-long gaboon viper with the longest fangs of any snake in the world or over two inches long. That would be a fatal bite. (laughs) There's a lot of fatal bites actually possible in these, but I promise (laughs) they will not be scary. They, everything you're, you're going to see will be geometric enough and cleaned up enough and, and static enough and perfect enough that I think that you'll be able to appreciate the, the finer aesthetic side of even the most fearsome organisms. Mm. Well, Chris, I know uh, between today and when you open, there's a lot of setup that you have to do. So I really appreciate you taking the time and can't wait to see it. Can't wait to see the exhibit. I'm, from everything I've seen of your work, I'm sure it's going to be phenomenal. Thanks so much, John. I love talking to you. Yeah, thank you. Well, that's all for us today here on CityCast Portland. But be sure to check out Christopher Marley's new exhibit, Exquisite Creatures Revealed. It's opening this Saturday, October 5th at OMSI, and it's going to run through February 17th of next year. And the exhibit is included in the cost of general admission to OMSI, so, you know, make a day out of it. You can find more information and tickets at omzi.edu. We'll also have a link to more information in this episode's show notes. Thanks for listening. I'm John Natariani. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more from around the city. Until then, see you at Slim's. Slim's.